God bless you. We want to greet you tonight in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus. Amen. I pray, God, that those that are on tonight are in good health and in good spirit. Amen. And I want to say Happy New Year to everybody. You know, as we step into this new year and the beginning of this year, I pray, God, that your life, that everything about you be filled with the promises of God's grace and God's guidance through the year. You know, as we gather for Bible study tonight, it's the first Bible study for the year. But, you know, in light of all that is happening, I sense uh, some anticipation, uh, you know, some, some good things, some renewal, some growth, I mean, some spiritual insight as we get into the new year. Praise God. And I pray God that tonight's study, as we start this year, that, you know, that at the end we'll be blessed, we'll be pumped up to go. Amen. We'll feel encouraged, enlightened. Amen. To go on another year. Once again, I want to welcome you to our Bible study again. And I pray God that you will be blessed in this year. I ask you right now to bow your head as we go into prayer, as we before we go into the study. Great God, we thank you tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness, which is better than life. We thank you for the opportunity one more time to study your word. And I pray, Lord God, that tonight's word will be a word of encouragement and that we will learn something from the scriptures tonight. I pray, God, that you'll touch my mind and my heart. You'll touch me as I'm about to deliver the word that you have placed in my heart to your people. I pray God will bless every person that will hear the word tonight. Help us, Lord Jesus, to not just be hearers of the word. You said in your words that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Bless every person here. Bless those who are visiting for the first time, who are watching this Bible study for the first time. Bless those who are regular persons who normally watch our study. Bless every saint and I help the God that tonight will be a difference, that tonight will be a change, that tonight will be a turnaround as we endeavor to study and to go deeper in your word. We look to you who is the author and the finisher of our faith in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So again, I want to greet you in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to bring greetings from our bishop. Bishop Garfield Daly, amen, all the elders, all the ministers want to bring you greeting from them, amen, in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus. So tonight, we will be getting into a particular topic as we start the year. You know, it's a new year and we want to approach the year with a mind, a mind to work a mind to work. Amen. And this is where we want to look at tonight. Our scripture uh, will be taken from Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, So build we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. And the Bible tell you why. For the people had a mind to work. So Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. Again, so build we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. Now, as we get into the study, I want us to understand that we'll be looking at the book of Nehemiah and what we can pull from the book. I want us to understand that when we look at it from an historical perspective, the book of Nehemiah, that is, we can go back prior to this and realize that there was a point in time in history that was called the United Kingdom period. And what had happened there that Israel had all the 12 nations or the 12 tribes working together. We had people like Saul and, and David and Solomon. So Saul was the first king. And then after Saul, there was David. And then after David, there was Solomon. There was something that happened, and we, we know Solomon had two sons. And due to uh, persons not listening to the voice of God, amen, due to disobedience, we realized that the kingdom was divided. So you have what is called a divided kingdom period. And the divided kingdom period had Israel in the north. So 10 tribes went to the north. And then to the south, we had Judah. 
Now, for a period of time, they existed together. Amen. Israel to the north, they call it the northern kingdom. And Judah to the south, that we call the southern kingdom. Uh, but Israel, in all its history, uh, had no good kings. And, and, and they often uh, went into a lot of idolatry. They worshiped the gods of the Canaanites. Amen. And it, God would have sent prophets to warn them about this. They did not listen till eventually the Assyrians came and took them down into what is called the Assyrian captivity. That was left with Judah in the south. Now, again, about a hundred years passed. Amen. And it's as if Judah had forgotten that what had happened to their brothers and their sisters in the north. Amen. And they too uh, started to live contrary. And God again would send prophets to them. One of the notable prophets that came was the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah would have preached to them and said, look here, you need to turn. You need to do this. God is going to bring you down into Babylonian captivity if you don't. And they did not listen, brothers and sisters. And God would raise up uh, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar uh, in about 583 BC, and he took Judah captive um, down into Babylon. That was their style. They would have taken people, amen, and what, whatever nations they captured, they would have taken them back, amen. It's not like the Assyrians who, when the Assyrians took over this, the northern kingdom, they all they did was, was intermarry with them, took over uh, the government, took over everything, Eventually, the Samaritans came from that. Or with the Babylonians, I mean, they would often take their people, exile into their Babylonian territory. We know what happened. Um, the first exile went down. Jeremiah preached and said, look here, uh, just build houses, live. God is going to bring you out after a certain time. The people did not listen to Jeremiah. Amen. And then after a period of time, Nebuchadnezzar came back. As a matter of fact, there were false prophets who rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and he had to come back. And he again, he took a second set down, but eventually he destroyed the city and he destroyed the walls. The walls were broken down. He destroyed the place. And this is very important for us to understand because now... Uh, Jerusalem was in ruins, amen. The, the city, the beloved city, amen, of Jerusalem was in ruins. The city was broken down. The walls were destroyed because of the rebellion. And it, and it, and it teaches us a lesson that, amen, judgment will come if we continue or if we choose to live contrary to how God would want us to live, amen. So, they went down into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. That is Judah. Eventually, amen, uh, we have people like Nebuchadnezzar. And during that time, you had prophets like Ezekiel, who was also in Babylonian captivity, and Daniel, who was also in Babylonian captivity. Now, after 70 years, God decided that he was going to take them out as he had prophesied. Amen. He would have taken them out of Babylonian captivity. Actually, Daniel read the scrolls of Jeremiah and he realized that God was about to take them out and he did pray. And it was, it was here that God gave him certain visions and so on. So God raised up people like Zerubbabel and Zerubbabel was the first person to lead the first set of Jews uh, from Babylon back to Jerusalem. I will find that in about Ezra chapter 1 and verse 6. Amen. So Zerubbabel led the first group or the first set of Jewish exilers to return in about 536 BC. Amen. So that's a big gap of what about 57 years. And, 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 and during that time, you can also place the book of Esther. So what had happened with Zerubbabel though, he played a very significant role when he brought the people out, he did the construction of the temple and he began the temple and he did, he completed that temple and he actually dedicated that temple. Amen. So that was Zerubbabel. Then God raised up another gentleman by the name of Ezra. And Ezra, you can find that story in Ezra chapter 7 to chapter 10. 
And he led the second set of people from about 455 BC. Amen. And he brought uh, people out about men and children and their families and he brought them back. And he was instrumental in, in again, establishing some things like the, the law and, and, and teaching them the word of God again. But after him, God raised up a man by the name of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is where we're going to be talking about because there's some stuff that we can learn from Nehemiah and there's some stuff that are applicable to us, amen, as a body, praise God. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So as we look over this history, we are now at Nehemiah. And let's see what we can learn from Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah, the name. The name Nehemiah is of the Hebrew origin and it holds a significant meaning. I mean, it actually means Yahweh comforts or it means the Lord comforts. And, and, and I strongly believe that when you have been going through a situation, when you have been going through a hard time, when, when, when things seem like it's not adding up, amen, there is there comes a point in time where God will give us a word of comfort, where God will send comfort for us. And I'm glad that he did say in the book of St. John that I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. I'm glad that the comforter is with us. Amen. And in a similar way, we learn that Nehemiah, the, the very meaning of the word Nehemiah, amen, is that Yahweh comforts or the Lord comforts. When you do a study on the book of Nehemiah itself, you realize that the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra in its original manuscript was actually one book. Now, in our Bible, as we have it, the King James Version of the Bible or the NIV Bible, we realize that you have Ezra, then we have Nehemiah. But in its original form, it was really one book. If we look at it in the Tenakh, which is practically uh, the, the, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Old Testament, amen, how they had it in their language, you realize that Nehemiah and Ezra was really one book. And the book uh, had two principal characters. You had a priest and you had a governor. Amen. You had a priest who was Ezra. You had a governor who was Nehemiah. So these the, the, these, these, this book is really a combination, as I said before, of uh, two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. So the book of Ezra really covers the return of the Jewish exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. And as if you're going to study, especially that whole uh, period of time after they came out of Babylonian captivity, they call it the, the post-exilic period. You're going to realize that you have to study the book of Ezra and then you have to study the book of Nehemiah if you want the order. Amen. Because first of all, Ezra was the first to take them out and he was instrumental, as I said before, in the rebuilding of the temple. But the book of Nehemiah focuses really on the reconstruction of Jerusalem's wall. You look at the, the spiritual restoration of the people because a lot was happening in the hearts of the people. Amen. And, 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 and book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra together give us that history. Praise God. So it's very important as we study this part of history and we study this book that we understand that even though there is a book of Nehemiah, originally it's a second part of one book that existed in the Tenakh or the Old Testament Amen. Or the Jewish Old Testament. Praise God. Now let's look at Nehemiah, the man himself. Now, Nehemiah, brothers and sisters, he served as a cup bearer. He was the cup bearer of Artaxerxes, who was the king of Persia. Now, now if you can remember in history, or let me not say if you can remember in history, uh, there came a point in time when Nebuchadnezzar, I would just said a while ago, who was the Babylonian uh, king who took Judah down into Babylonian captivity. Now, after him, God uh, used the Persians or the Medes, it's what I call Persians or the Medo Persian. Medo, because it's really a combination of two sets of people, the Medians and the Persians. But because the Persians was the bigger of the two, 
amen, they normally refer to them as the Persians. So it's interesting that Nehemiah uh, was the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, because the while they came out of Babylonian captivity, praise God, amen, the Persians were the nation that was in charge. Now, what makes this important uh, is that a cupbearer tasted the king's food, he tasted the king's drink, just to ensure that he wasn't poisoned. So when we say that um, Nehemiah was the cupbearer, it means that this man was a man that was trusted. He was, he was like the personal aid to the king. And it's important that we understand that all the appointments to see the king had to be made through and approved by the cupbearer. So when we talk about who Nehemiah was, it's important that we get the point that Nehemiah was not just any normal person. He made the approval to who to the king. He approved it. You had to make an appointment through him in order for you to approach the king. Praise God. We can go on to say that Nehemiah was like a uh, head of the, in, in today, secret service. So he was like the chief of staff. He was the, the king's most trusted confidant. They were very important man. Um, this man Nehemiah was. Amen. He was powerful. He was influential. He was wealthy. Obviously, he was highly respected by the king. But more importantly, what made Nehemiah stand out in scripture is not because the Persian king Artaxerxes respected him, but because he was also a godly man. So when you when you when you look at everything that that characterized this man Nehemiah, you realize that he was really uh, in the perfect position to help his people. You see, God will position you, Amen. God will put you in places because He has a work for you to do. Amen. Irrespective of where you work, irrespective of what you do, amen, God put you in that place so that at the end of the day, if you are a child of God, a godly person, that he can be glorified. There was a prophet, amen, who uh, who was in Israel and there was a man who had leprosy and God placed this little girl as a servant of this mighty man. I'm saying, okay, oh, if you were in Israel, we have a prophet who would have told you what to do. Amen. God placed her there so that she could have given a word to this man, so that this man would have known, amen, that there was a prophet. In a similar way, God had placed Nehemiah in a position as cupbearer, as a, as a personal help to Artaxerxes, amen, as a person who would taste the man's food and the man's wine and the man's drink to ensure that it was not poisoned. That means if you wanted to poison the king, the the, the 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 um the cup bearer would have died he would have died because he had to taste it he had to eat it he probably a little time had to pass to ensure that whatever the king got would have been good um and therefore because he was in such a position as we said before he was trusted by the king he was one of the king's most trusted friend amen because of who he was so nehemiah brothers and sisters was in a perfect position, God had placed him there so that he could help his people. Now, what was the issue that was at hand in the book of Nehemiah? If you look at uh, the scripture that we're going to read now, he said, and it came to pass, and it's Nehemiah chapter one, in the month Chislu, in the 12th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. This is where we actually jump into the book of Nehemiah that we are about to talk about tonight. So what we just read a while ago in chapter one, the Bible speaks about a gentleman by the name of Hanani, hope I pronounce his name properly. But according to history, he was the brother of Nehemiah, praise God. 
And it so happened that he went to Jerusalem and he arrived back and he was giving Nehemiah a report of how, what was taking place in Jerusalem. Nehemiah asked him about the Jews that were in Jerusalem. He asked him about the state of the city. And, he, and, and the report that he got from his brother, it kind of disturbed him. It troubled him. And it, makes, it, it shows me something about Nehemiah. Even though he was miles away, praise God, from his city, even though he was miles away from Jerusalem, the man's heart was on the things of God. It shows us again the type of person Nehemiah was. You know, a lot of persons out of the presence of church, they have nothing to do with church. Out of the presence of, of being around the people of God, they, their, their mind is not on that. But here is a man that realized that, look here, he, he wanted to know what was the state of the city. He wanted to know how his brothers, how the Jews were, how his brothers and sisters were that were in Jerusalem. So that thing disturbed him. The Bible said he, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. In other words, what he was practically saying is that the people were in trouble and there was a disgrace. And I want to say that the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burnt with fire. My God. Now, how did Nehemiah react to such a message? Nehemiah reacted with deep sorrow. He was weeping. He was mourning for days. So Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah reaction was that he was sad he got a bad news he got information that he did not want i i i, I and you know i like to 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 realize that nehemiah having gotten a bad news his response again tell us a lot about how we should respond when we having problems the bible said he prayed for four months between Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, and Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1, there is a period of about four months. And Nehemiah, having received a bad news, decided, like, look here, man, his instant reaction is to go down in prayer. He was sorrowful. He was hurting. He was crying. Um, and he decided that he was going to go down in prayer in fasting and in prayer. I pray God that, you know, for 2024, when if we should receive a bad report, if something should happen to us, that our first reaction will be that we will go down in fasting and praying. Amen. I pray God that for 2024, we will change our approach to how we do things. Now, this begs the question then, why would anybody go down in deep sorrow and weeping and mourning for days over a wall? Because if you can remember, uh, Ezra and Zerubbabel had already gone ahead and they had already uh, reconstructed the temple. What was not repaired was the wall. So Nehemiah's reaction begs the question, why would someone cry so much over a wall? Why would somebody mourn so much over a wall. But you see, Nehemiah understood his time. And in order for us to, to get an understanding of why it affected him so much, we have to go back to his time. So Nehemiah was saddened because the walls of Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, what that means is that it left the city vulnerable to attacks. In, so in ancient times, city walls were crucial. They were very important for protecting and for securing the people. So protection and security played a very important role, or better, the walls play a very important role in protecting and securing uh, the people. A city 
without walls was vulnerable to attacks. It was vulnerable for reading and, and for all kind of other dangers that would have come. So Nehemiah knew that even though Jerusalem had its temple repaired, had a dedication, the fact that the city had no walls, it was left for attack. Anybody from anywhere could have come and attacked that particular city. It was vulnerable. Um, it, there was no way of protecting its, its inhabitants. Amen. It was just open to any and anybody. You could have walked in or walked out. Now, let us just look at this now from a spiritual sense as we get into having a mind to work. In a spiritual sense, the wise man Solomon made a statement. He said in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Let me say it again. Proverbs 25 verse 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So when we compare the physical with the spiritual, what the wise man was saying is that you have you lack self-control, just like a city without wall emphasizes vulnerability and, and all of these things. An individual who does not exercise restraint is just like that city. Now, why am I saying this? For, for this year, one of the things I would encourage us to do as children of God is that we're going to be asking God as we, as we begin to rebuild the walls of our lives, as we begin to rebuild what God has promised us, we're going to realize that there are some things that we need to, to, to put in check. As individuals, we need to have self-control. We need to safeguard against impulsive actions. We need to safeguard ourselves against emotional turmoils and, and, the, and the potential negative outcomes that arise from lack of restraint. I've seen over the years where uh, saints would, whatever comes to their mind, they're, they're having issues, they're having problems with another brother or a sister, and they would put on their status some stuff uh cussing out the person and and talking all kind of things you know for 2024 let us make a change with some of these things because if we don't have rule over our own spirit it's like a city that is broken down and without walls let us try to change how we respond to some things prayerfully the wise man is warning us about the risk of being unable to manage our own emotions and, and impulses that, that will come. You know, somebody do you something. Let us try to, 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 to exercise self-control. And to be, to be honest, this really is a part of the fruit of the spirit. Uh, self-control, restraint. We can't leave ourselves exposed to the harm and the danger that the devil wants to put in our lives. So, Nehemiah was sad because the city walls were broken down. The fact that the city walls were broken down and they were not rebuilt means the city was vulnerable to attacks. Amen. In a similar way, let us try to, to have some control of our, our own spirit for 2024 so that we cannot be looked upon like a city that is broken down and without walls. Amen. Can I tell you something? As I've said it before, it's interesting that not much uh, opposition came, even though they had opposition, but it wasn't as great as in the book of Nehemiah, in the case of Ezra and Zerubbabel. So the devil is okay for us rebuilding, uh, going to church and setting back up that, that place of worship in our lives. But what he doesn't want us to do is to set boundaries against where he can go. Amen. In 2024, we are going to have control over our own spirit. We're going to lock the devil out. Amen. We're going to be careful how we speak against each other as brothers and sisters. We're going to be careful what we say out of our mouth about leadership. 
because we're going to realize that any person who behaves like this is in a state where they are vulnerable, in a state where they are not, where they should be in God. They are without restraint. Amen. And praise God, we don't want to be in that light. So Nehemiah really was sad because of what was taking place. And his first response, as I said earlier, was simply to find a place of prayer. That's how we will respond. He found a place of prayer, praise God, for four months. Then after he found a place of prayer, better yet, in his prayer, we can highlight some things about his reaction also. Number two is that Nehemiah reacted in his prayer by requesting God's favor for his upcoming conversation with the king of Persia. He knew that he realized the state of what was happening, but he knew that he had to get permission from the king. So the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11 that, O Lord, and this is Nehemiah praying, he says, I beseech thee, let not thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, talking about Artaxerxes, for I was the king's cup bearer. Nehemiah was weeping, but he realized that in his prayer, in his conversation with God, he wanted God to grant him favor for his upcoming conversation with the king of Persia. In other words, he understood that as he prayed, he wanted God to grant favor in what he's about to do. There are some stuff, there are some things that we have embarked on as a church. And there are some people that we have asked God to give us favor in their sight. I am seeing where some of the doubters, amen, are going to be troubled. Because when you are in the will of God, when you're doing the things of God, amen, and you pray according to what God have you to, according to how God would have you to pray, you realize that God will grant you that favor, amen. So his reaction was God, the people of God, amen, are in trouble. The people of God don't have a place. The people of God need a central place. But God grant us mercy in the sight of this man. Amen. So he reacted in prayer by asking God to grant him favor in the eyes of the king of Persia. Number three, he reacted in prayer by asking God, by expressing his willingness to be instrumental in the changing and rebuilding process. So again, in Nehemiah chapter one and verse 11, which I didn't place on the screen here, we say it, there's a point in there where he says, I pray thee thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So this request was prosperity and mercy in the sight of the king implies Nehemiah's desire to be successful in the upcoming conversation with the king of Persia. He wanted to be instrumental in the change and rebuilding. He wanted to initiate this process of rebuilding Jerusalem's wall. Can I tell somebody something that the process of rebuilding, uh, the process of rebuilding starts with prayer. This process of, 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 of getting to where God would want us to go starts with how we react to even what the negative news was. And as, as a child of God, I can tell you that sometimes the enemy would want us to be discouraged. Sometimes the enemy would want us to feel out of it. But let us learn from Nehemiah. He prayed. Amen. For four months. And his prayer involved that he wanted to go before the king. Amen. And he wanted to find favor or the king to find favor. Uh, and he wanted also to be willing uh, and instrumental in the rebuilding and the process that is supposed to come. Now, the process of rebuilding, you're going to realize that there are two important things that are very important in the life of a child of God as we begin to rebuild ourselves for 2024. One, there must be a rebuilding of our temple. In other words, if your, your, your spiritual life 
need to be at a place where it is rebuilt. I can personally tell you that none of us are perfect. I can personally tell you that we have all made mistakes, but whatever it is that, uh, had, that was broken down, whatever it is that had gone away, it can be rebuilt. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The scripture tells us to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So as we rebuild our spiritual life, we're going to realize that there are two important things that are very important. One, the rebuilding of the temple, which is symbolic of the place of worship, is symbolic of our our uh, relationship with God. It's, it's, it's symbolic of, of being in the presence of God. It means that we need to rebuild our prayer lives. It means that we need to rebuild our fasting life. It means that we need to rebuild our reading of the word. The process of rebuilding uh, says that, look here, I have to put these things in place. But similarly, while we're rebuilding the temple, a part of the process is to fortify our walls against the enemy. It means that we can't live any and any way. Amen. For 2024, amen, we have to set standards for ourselves. Amen. And, and, and you know, people have to say this is legalistic to say don't do that or don't. But trust me, when you set a standard for yourself, amen, what you're saying is that enemy, I will not allow you to cross this. Amen. And it's important that we do that. Because if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. Amen. If you don't have something in your life, a standard that you stand up for. Amen. Barriers that are set, walls that are built in your life. Amen. You're going to realize that the enemy will have free access in and out. Any person that I've seen who have decided to remove certain standards from their life, it's just a matter of time where everything begins to go. Amen. It's like a slippery slope. The ones you start to remove some little things, uh, you start here. But like drifting, amen, in a matter of time, you end up at a place where you didn't want to go. So as we rebuild things in our lives, amen, we must rebuild our, the temple of our lives, or we must fortify the walls in our lives against the enemy. Praise God. I pray God that for this year, as we start this year, that we will begin to rebuild our lives, the temple, and, and set up standards for ourselves. In Jesus' name. Now, there are some things that we must do as we prepare for the task ahead. I can tell you that there are some tasks that is coming our way. Amen. But we can learn through the scriptures. We can learn through principle. Amen. From the book of Nehemiah, how to set up these tasks as we prepare ourselves. Amen. To embark on some great things for 2024. Amen. Now, number one, as we prepare to, to for the task, there are a few things we should do. Let us start here. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 to 4 says, And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchre, light waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Amen. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? So I pray to the God of heaven. Nehemiah, as I said before, was the cupbearer. Nehemiah was in a position that granted him proximity to the king. And, 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 and Nehemiah uh, was that place where he could have requested from the king. What we realize is that Nehemiah got the news. Nehemiah spent hours in prayer and God positioned him at the right time for the king to even recognize that his countenance had fallen. And the king asked him, why are you so sad? How you look so? It's, it's not normal for you, Nehemiah, to come in the presence of the king and looking like this. And Nehemiah, under the inspiration of God, said, look here, I am sad because the place of my father's sepulcher light waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. But here the good part, the king said, what's the request you're asking of me? And I like what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah went back in prayer. So the first thing as you prepare for the task is that you need to talk to the king. 
And this before, as the cup bearer, he had close access to the king. So prior to approaching the king, Nehemiah engaged in prayer and he seek divine favor and guidance. And it was here where the king was able to, uh, to grant him what he wanted. It was here because he went in prayer and he, he went before the king, having gone in prayer, that God would have granted him the favor and the guidance that he needed. There's a teacher who would normally teach us in Sunday school when I was younger. He made a statement like this. He said, talk to God about men before you talk to men about God. In a similar way, it's applicable because whatever it is that Nehemiah, the favor he wanted from King Artaxerxes, before running to the king, he spoke to God about it. So by the time he came to Artaxerxes, even though he was close to the king, the king could have said, no, you are my trusted bearer. You are the person that if something happens, then uh, you are the one who would have uh, provided that protection. Why would I set you free to go and do what you need to do? But guess what? He spoke to God for four months and God released him and he went and he spoke to the king. So God's favor was evident as the king not only granted Nehemiah permission to leave, but what we realize is that the king also provided him all the resources that he, was, that he would have needed for the task. That's how God works. When God moved us as a church, God did not just tell Bishop Grizzle, look here, I'm going to do this. But God is putting in place all the resources that is going to be needed for the task. God knew that for a period of time, this is what we would have needed so that we'd have built faith. So we'd have understood that at the end of the day, it is God's working and not ours. That is why sometimes God will bring us to a place where sometimes you say, God, why I had to go through all of this? It's like the children of Israel going through the wilderness. God, they could have taken a week, but God brought them through a wilderness so that they could have understood that it was God's hand that was in the process. So that you can understand when you go through your hard times, you will realize that at the end of the day, it is his God who is doing it and not me. When you have reached a place where it must be God, when four days had passed and your situation is dead and stinking, amen, and you in your mind, you're saying, God, if you had done it four days before, it could have been done. And God said, no, no, no. You don't understand who I am. I am the resurrection and the life. So when God grant favor to Nehemiah, he did not even give us the permission to leave, but he also granted the resources for the task. God will give you what you need so that you can go through the process okay. God has given us what we needed so that we could sit under a tent for a couple of years. And looking back, a lot of people would have probably fainted. A lot of people naturally could not have gone through this. But for years, we were under a place, have service every single Sunday in our hot sun. But God gave us everything we needed. And God gave us all the resources we needed for the task. So the first preparation is that he talked to the king. And God gave him close access to the king so that he could have spoken to him. But notice what Nehemiah did. He prayed before he spoke to the king. Then the second thing he did in preparation for the task was he talked to the governor. So in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 9 to 10, we see where Nehemiah, having now gotten permission from Artaxerxes, he was now able to go, praise God, into Jerusalem with letters from the king addressed to the governor of the region beyond the river, providing safe passage and access to timber for the construction. What am I saying here is that when God gives us a word, when you get a word from the king, 
when you get a word that this is what God is doing, then with that word, you can go forward to people saying that, look here, it might not look how you think it's going to look, but I have a word from the king. There is a letter that is going to grant me safe access. There's a letter that says, look here, I'm going to get the timber that I need for the construction. So this actually displays authority from the king, uh, reinforced Nehemiah's legitimacy and facilities journey to Jerusalem. So when he arrived with the letter, he was able to give the governor and he got everything that he needed because the king of Persia, the superpower, was able to give him a word. Brethren, I'm glad in preparation for the task, we need to pray. In preparation for the task, we need to talk to the king. In preparation for the task, we get a word so that we can go to others with that word, saying that this is what God has said. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Now, having God in with the letter, the third thing that Nehemiah did was that he assess the situation in Jerusalem. Praise God. So we find in Nehemiah chapter 2 from verse 11 to 15 that upon reaching Jerusalem, Nehemiah secretly checked the walls and he did this in the night. He did it quietly. So he didn't want to worry the people or he didn't want to alert any of the enemies. Sometimes when God gives you some things, you have to check it out secretly, you know? You have to be sure that, oh God, this is what you want me to do. Sometimes you have to do it under the cover of darkness. Meaning, you are doing it in such a way that you're not telling everybody about Because not everybody is going to believe you. Amen. So this hidden look, let us let him see what the walls was. And, and, the, and he saw what the gate was for himself. Even though his brother gave him information, he was able to see what was taking place. He was careful to understand everything. What was, he understood the situation well. He knew what was taking place before he, he told the people and before he started rebuilding the work. So the approach that Nehemiah had, it demonstrates his strategic foresight in ensuring that he understood comprehensively the challenges that were about to come. And he also wanted to ensure that he was able to reveal the plan of God to the people about the rebuilding project. Can I tell you something? I strongly believe that Bishop Daly, Bishop Grizzle, they heard from God in relation to where we are going. And I strongly believe that under the cover of darkness, the man was able to assess how much it would cost. He looked at the what, what, what was needed for the plan. He looked at everything. And when he got that understanding, he brought it to the people. Now, some people doubted it. I've heard where people are saying why he could not have done it this way. Why it couldn't be done that way. But when God gives you a letter, when God gives you a word, you can hold on to that. You can, you can, you can close your eyes to the naysayers and know that when God speaks and you are prepared for the task, amen, you assess the situation and you look and you look at what is happening and you assess it in the quiet so that when you come before the people, it is a word from God. And then he led the people and he communicated the vision. So what Nehemiah did, he gathered the people and the leaders of Jerusalem. He shared the vision that he had with them. He conveyed the urgency and the necessity of rebuilding that wall. We need to set this up. There are some things that God is going to give you this year. There's some rebuilding that you need to do. Sometimes you have to stop and check with yourself and say, what? You have to assess the walls and assess the situation and assess where you are. Amen. In your own secret place. And you have to look and say, God, I need to fix this. I need to set that in place. I need to put this together. Amen. And then what, you, what you're going to do, you're going to emphasize that it's the hands of God in the endeavor. It's not God's will that any should perish. It's God's will that we live a Christian life. So Nehemiah inspired that people by well by articulating a clear plan and invited them to participate actively in the restoration so in summary what we learn from that is that in order for us to 
prepare for a task that the Lord has placed upon us, we need to have prayerful pre preparation that is essential in the work. It starts there. So Nehemiah prayed before taking action. And it shows the very importance of seeking God's guidance and God's favor in anything we do. The, the writer says, in all thy ways, the wise man, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Then he seek author, authorization, which is necessary. So he didn't act independently, but he sought the proper support from the king, the proper authorization from the king and the regional governors. And he, 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 he demonstrated the significance of securing support and permission when embarking on significant tasks. So you prayerfully talk to God. God gave you a word. Then you start look and to do things the right way. There are some people that God is going to send you to. There are some people that need to open some doors. There are some places. And don't worry about it. You might say, oh, those people are not. No, some people are going to be saved. Some people are going to be unsaved. But God is going to use them. Everybody is in the hands of God for the child of God. So God will use these set of people to open certain doors. God will use certain people to open other doors. But it's all for his glory. So lesson number three, we need to assess the situation, which is crucial. So Nehemiah discreetly assessed where the wall was and he wants to understand the scope and the challenges that come with that. And then lastly, the vision and the leadership that is needed. So Nehemiah had a clear vision and he wanted to communicate that effectively so that the people would understand and be able to participate in the work. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? There are some great things that are coming our way. And I want us to understand that we have a leader, praise God, under God, who has a vision, who has, who has a clear vision and is able to communicate under God where he wants us to go. Amen. Let us go with God. Now, as we are here, I want us to understand that there is no opportunity without opposition. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivered him out of them all. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says that if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And we need to understand that uh, Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world, he shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. As a child of God, once we are embarking on something that has to do with the kingdom of God, you're going to have wrestlings and you're going to have, you're going to have troubles coming from both externally and internally. So you have, you have troubles coming from the outside, but you're going to have troubles also coming from the inside. So the opposition will come externally and internally. But Ephesians 6.12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So opposition is going to come. Look at the external oppositions. You're going to have criticism. You're going to have mocking and scorning. You're going to have false accusations. You're going to have fearful threats. You're going to have conspiracies. I'm going to go through this to show you what happened with Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, But when some ballot and hornet and Tobiah the servant, so some ballot the hornet and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, the Gershim, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? So some Balat and Tobiah and Gershom, they express some, some, some contempt and they question the motives of Nehemiah. What they wanted to do was to set up some form of rebellion. They were saying that, look here, these men are rebelling against the king for the rebuilding of Jerusalem wall. So what we find is that when you start to do a work, you're going to have criticism. They're going to have criticism on many levels people are going to say oh, what are them do you know to say the project too big why they never take on something smaller 
why them couldn't find another place? Why such an expensive task? But nothing is new under the sun. There's always going to be a Sambalat and a Tobiah. There's always going to be a Geshem who is going to come along the way and try to stop the work. Direct criticism. They're going to criticize it. They're going to laugh at it. They're going to say, look at this, can't, look, that cannot work. But we understand that there's an opposition that's coming. Apart from their criticism, there's mocking and scorning. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. And here it is now. They were halfway in building the wall. And you would have thought that they would have backed off because obviously something is going. You pay down some of the money. You have some things in process. You're doing some things at work. And you think that some people would have stopped talk. But this is where they start to mock and scorn. But it came to pass that when some Balak heard that when you build the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of the rubbish which are burnt? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their, their stone walls. In other words, we find that opposition got so bad that that they were mocking on another level. They were saying the wall that you're building is no good. If a fox go up on it, the wall is going to break down. The mocking got so terrible that if you read the last part of Nehemiah chapter 4, from about verse 17, somewhere there, the opposition said that, look here, with one hand the people begin to build, and with another hand they begin to hold the weapon. And why they had to do that? Because the mocking was coming. And therefore, they had to be vigilant while they continued the construction. So some would work on building the wall with one hand and hold their tool, while with the other hand, they held the weapons. So they held the weapons like the sword and the spear while they work. I don't know how they did it, but God gave them that vigilance to know that we're working, but we are understanding that the enemy not going back off of this work. Brethren, there are some great things coming for 2024. I am privy to a few little things <laughs> that is going to happen under God. And I can tell you that as a body, we need to continue to build by faith, but we need to put up our sword and our spear. We need to be ready to defend against any attack that the enemy is going to come with because the work, the construction is going to come to pass. Amen. Ah, uh, we have to be ready to protect ourselves wholeheartedly. We have to dedicate ourselves again to the task of rebuilding what God is set in our hearts to put in place. Amen. We understand the necessity of having the wall. We understand the necessity of what God wants us to have as a church. Amen. There are going to come some things, some mocking and some scorning. We're going to have some, some ballot and to buy up. And some, some people are going to be bitter. Amen. But we're going to have to fortify ourselves. Amen. We're going to have to build our efforts. We're going to have to ensure that we set up ourselves because guess what happened? We are vulnerable without the wall. And we need it. We need it. We need it. So we're going to have mocking and scorning. When that don't work, you will have false accusations. So the Bible said in Nehemiah chapter 6 from verse 5 to 7, Then send some ballot his servant unto me in like manner, the fifth time with an open letter in his hands, where it was given it report among the Jews. And Geshmu said it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayst be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come near, therefore, and let us take counsel together. So here we find that some ballot start falsely now accusing Nehemiah of attempting to become king. They said that the only reason why he took on this project is because he wants to set up himself as king. You know, people are saying, boy, the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because this person wants to be bigger than everybody else. They are alleging 
that he appoint himself to be king. Alleged that he appointed some people as prophets to propagate his claims. In other words, him, him set himself with some other people to spread the false news. And why did Sambalat do that? He was trying to sow discord uh, and, 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 and report it to the king. He wanted to sow discord and send back to King Artaxerxes. And look here, this is what is happening. So in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 5 to 7, it describes an instance where some ballot um, adversary sent a fabricated letter. And the letter contained false accusations that the Jews were plotting to rebel. Amen. They were plotting some rebellion. And Nehemiah had appointed prophets in Jerusalem to support his false narrative. They, they, they were coming with some, some, some false things. That's what the enemy is going to do. They're going to tell some lies. They're going to tell some things and look here, this and this is happening. And it's, the old, the only reason that, the, that, that Bishop Dale is doing this is because of this. Amen. They want to undermine and Nehemiah's work and credibility. Brethren, don't fall for that. There's false accusations. There's external oppositions coming. Then when that don't work, you will have fearful threat. Nehemiah chapter 5 from verse 6 to 7, which is the scripture that we just read. So they are actually saying that, look here, they're going to say to the king that there's a rebellion being planned. And therefore, the people are going to become fearful because of this rebellion. But brethren, people are going to become scared because they look like things are falling apart. I mean, I hear nothing about what is happening for months. For months, we don't know what's happening. Fearful, yes, it's nothing now going on. Fearful threats. Then they're going to have conspiracy. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 8 and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Then Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 2, then some ballot and Geshem sent unto him, Geshem sent unto him, say unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do mischief. So some ballot and others conspired to fight against Jerusalem, aiming to obstruct the city's reconstruction and engaging in mischief against Nehemiah. Then come and say, look, you just stop it, man. Come and may talk. But while they're, they sound as if they are with us, they are not with us. Their only aim is only to sort mischief and to, to kill the man. Come down from the wall, man. Come down from building and let me go to, oh, no. The plane of, oh, no, and let us have a discussion because all the things that we were doing before, we did wrong. But now we want to put God. I thank God that we serve a God who sees all things and knows all things. While this project is at hand, we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop because God has given us a mind to work. A mind to work. I want if somebody could say, okay, we're not going to stop. God has given us a mind to work. No, the, the, the things that will come our way will not only be external, but if we have internal opposition. What are the external oppositions that come? Discouragement and dissensions and weak believers and false prophets. Look at what the Bible says. The discouragement. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 10 to 11. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burden is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither shall till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. So the people involved in rebuilding the wall felt discouraged. Discouragement is going to come. They saw the task as great. They saw, they saw this task before them that they couldn't do. One, there was a lot of debris. And there was a sense that they were incapable of doing the work. And moreover, apart from that discouragement, their adversaries were spreading fear. They were threatening them to attack and to sabotage the work. And so this caused the people to feel discouraged. Brethren, I know that we have that phase where we are going through some things in your life. God promised you something. God said, look here, I'm going to do this for you. But in the midst of that, the work looks so hard and troubled. Some that you feel discouraged. There is so much debris. There is so much garbage. There's a sense that you're unable to get the thing done. There's a sense of discouragement. 
And apart from that, the enemy is sending fearful words and threatening and saying, you can't get this. If you do this, we're going to attack. But brethren, amidst the eternal opposition that will come, even from within the body, even from within fam, <clears throat> let us keep focused, those of us who know that we trust in God and we trust God's word. God will make a way. God will bring us out. God will finish what he has started. Praise God. So amidst the discouraging word, we're continuing. Then we're going to have dissensions. Nehemiah chapter 5 from verse 1 to 19. It says, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For they were that said, We are our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore we are we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also that were some also that were that said we have mortgaged our land, vineyards and houses that we might buy corns because of the dearth. Therefore also that said we have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren. Our children as their children. And Lord, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. For, our, for other men have our lands and vineyards. Let me explain that. There was an internal conflict among the Jewish people, among the people themselves. And what had happened amidst this great project, they were facing economic hardship. They were having internal stripes, stripes that were coming their way. And what had happened is that people were complaining about their economic burdens. Uh, the, the, the high taxes and they, they had to pay and the, the, the hardship they faced to sustain their families. And it's led to tension and cries of distress among the people. Can I tell you, you know, as we embark on the project, some people will say, how are you going to afford that? Look at what is happening in Jamaica. Look at all the issues that we are facing and the troubles and the situation. And the enemy is going to send something that look, you can't do it. You have too much. And, and the conflict will be internal among us. Taxes and things going up and school fee to pay. And how is it that I must give towards this? When I have this and that and that coming and that coming and I can hardly afford this. But I was telling a friend of mine that look here. When you sow. There's all there's a sowing season. There's a reaping season. Normally you reap much more than you sow. When you sow into the kingdom of God. God is going to be a debtor to no man. What you have given as night for a day. God is going to bless you. And when God bless you, you are well blessed. Your blessing might not come from where you expect it to come from. God might just give you a promotion on the job just because you gave. God will just, God will just put you right. God will just pay some bills. God will just remove some debt. Don't allow the economic situation, the hardship and the strives internally to affect us. Number three, you're going to have weak believers. Says, and it came to pass, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 12, it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all the places from which she shall return and put on us that will we be unto you. I explained that the Jews living near their enemies were constantly warning them of impending attacks. Amen. Causing people to be fearful and, and anxiety among the people. In other words, a lot of things were coming your way. It's not like you hear it one time. But people come up and say, look at Naga work. We still do this. So. You know, so say, not Naga on. And people became weak because they, let, they, 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 they opened their ears to people who spoke doubtful words. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In a similar way, when people start speaking doubt into your spirit, sometimes you need to block them out. You're going to have internal opposition where weak believers say, look here, it don't look like nothing's going to happen. Amen. Things not change. But brethren, hold your place in Zion. Because as night fall a day, the blessing is coming. They may have false prophets. 
And we've ex got through the verse here. But what had happened is that despite the task at hand, you had certain men who decided that, look here, they're going to set themselves up as prophets. And they're going to say, look here, they claim that God give them a word. And what you try to do is lure the people in away from the work. Amen. He wanted to bring Nehemiah into a part of the temple so that he can, can be out of tune with what God would have told him to do. Amen. They want to discredit him and to stop the work. You're going to have false prophets and false men coming and say, look here, I hear from God. I'm a man of God. And therefore, God did not say that. You want, you want, you want. The prophet said, look here, shut up. Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us shut the doors of the temple. For there I, and they come and they want to slay the man of God in the night. But I'm happy that we don't open our ears and we don't put out our ears to everybody. You can read the scriptures because there's a lot that happened here. But I praise God that look here, irrespective of the false prophets and the false. That's why sometimes, brethren, is that everything you need to tell everybody. Because you're going to have some people all of a sudden they hear from God. And it's not everybody who said they hear from God, hear from God. Some of them are only they, they're only been used by the enemy. So we're going to have challenges. Opposition is going to come from some Balat and Tobiah and others who laugh and despise and accuse and attack the work. But I like the fact that apart from this, Nehemiah and the people, they persisted despite strong opposition. They showed remarkable determination in the face of adversity. Brethren, let us keep at it. Let's be, let us be persistent. Let us be determined. Why? Let us have a mind to work. So I start where I stop. It says, so build we the wall. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. Why? For the people had a mind to work. Brethren, in 2024, have a mind to work. Be persistent and resilient. Despite all the discouragement that will come and all the attacks that is going to come from every side. You see, these two words, persistent and resilient, I want you to define it. So I look in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and it says persistent means firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. And resilience means the ability to recover or adjust easily from misfortune or change. The capability to spring back or rebound successfully successfully from adversity. We're going to have some brethren, we have to be persistent in what we're doing. We have to know that obstacles are going to come and difficulties are going to come. But guess what? We are pushing through. We need to be resilient because sometimes it may look like things go up. I remember when we were at the park, we were convinced that this is what was going to happen. And God, God who understood our faith, knew this is not where I want you to be. And some people started to argue, I said, look, I'm not going to go there. Why am I to do this? Why, but you have to be resilient. And despite the misfortune that we had to leave and we had to change and we had to move, we have to, we have, we have, to have that spring back mentality that, that we bound. Uh, we can, we can rebound successfully from our adversity. God is going to do our work. We have to be persistent and resilient. We have to have a mind to work. I'm going to tell you why we need that mind. Paul says in Romans chapter 7 verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I may serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The word mind in that particular verse from a Greek word, uh, nos, it refers to the intellect, the understanding or the faculty of perceiving and judging. Can I tell you, Shaila God, the reason why we need to have a mind to work is because the mind is a powerful thing. It has the ability to, 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 to make choices. So our mind have to be at the place where we can make the right choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 to 20 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. He said, I have set before you life and death, 
blessings and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. In other words, what the verse is teaching us is that, look here, God give us choices. And how you make that choice? Because you have a mind. And the mind have the capability to make those choices. It have the ability to envision things. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Carting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What am I saying, brethren? Is that with the mind, you can envision things. The enemy is going to try to push something and say, now nah, the work. But if you have a mind that, look here, God is going to do this. I envision us in a sanctuary. I envision God doing some things for us. I envision God setting some people in their rightful place. I envision God, God moving us as a church and as a body. And because I envision the work of God and I've gotten a word from God, I'm going to cast on imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the word of God. I'm going to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Your mind is possible or it's powerful, brethren, because it has the capacity to engage in meditation. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but you shall meditate in day and night, that he may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. In other words, with the mind, you can meditate upon the word. When the enemy try to poke some things and send some discouraging people and send some discouraging things, you can meditate upon the word. I said, if God makes a promise, the promise must come to pass. God's word is exalted above everything else. He has exalted his, his word above his very name. We can say that heaven and earth will pass away before one of God's word to fall or to not come to pass. And if God made a promise to us, we can hold that word to say it will come to pass. If you have the ability to meditate upon the word, it has the power to plan. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5 says, praise God, Proverbs chapter 21 verse uh, 5, it says the thoughts of the diligent tend only towards plenty of Praise God. But everyone that is hasty only to want. The word thought there, the plans of the diligent tend only to plenty us. We can plan. We can say, God, we make some plans and we put some things in place. I personally know that based on words and things that are happening, there are some plans that are in place. And our mind, we have a mind to work. We are planning. Put yourself in a place. Plan for what God is going to do in your life. Set yourself, see yourself in a place. God, see yourself in a part of the work. See yourself playing a block. See yourself having the sword. See yourself helping to rebuild that wall. You have the ability to make a choice. You have the ability to, to envision what God is going to do. You have the ability to, to meditate upon the word of God. And your mind has the ability to plan for what God is about to do. I borrow the words of Frank D. Roosevelt. He says, the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. In other words, why some people, I remember one prophet, he gave a prophecy and the people didn't believe it. And the prophet said, look, you're going to see it, you know. You're going to see it. Because you doubt the word of God, you're going to see it. But you're not going to partake in it. Don't let that be you. The only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Trust God. Trust the things of God. Trust the man of God. As long as he's not leading down some road which, I, which I, I don't see. Trust what God has placed in our midst. Trust the, the Rima word from God. Trust the fact that God has given us a word that he's going to do some great things. The people were able to accomplish the rebuilding of the wall because they had a mind to work. When you have a mind to work, things can happen. We see people who had a made up mind that look here, something must happen. Matthew chapter 15, 21 to 28, we talk about the Canaanite woman. The woman approached Jesus pleading for her daughter's healing. And 
even though she was discouraged, even though it seemed as if it was an initial dismissal, she was persistent and she was she was the woman who said, look here, I can't take the children's meat and give to dogs. She was persistent. She, she demonstrated unwavering faith. And her persistence led to her daughter's healing. Have a made up mind. God is going to bring it to pass. We see the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 34. She, she, she suffered for 12 years. She pursued healing by persist or seeking out doctors and so on and nothing worked. So she started to seek out the only person who can, Jesus. She couldn't get to touch him totally, but she knew that if she touched the hem of his garment, then something would happen. So her resilience led to her immediate healing when she touched just the cloak. She had a made up mind. You talk about Jesus brought up the parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8, about this woman. She was a persistent widow. She continuously sought justice for an unjust, from an unjust judge. And her persistence paid off. And the judge eventually grants her request to avoid further trouble. There are some things, God, it looked like no now happen. But keep praying. Keep seeking God. Because you have a made up mind. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters, in closing? In the end, because the people had a mind to work, because the people were, were, were adamant in rebuilding the wall, it took them 52 days to rebuild. Not 52 years, 52 days to build the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And why that happened? Again, because the people had a mind to work. In this season as a church, let us understand the vision that the church has. Let us cultivate a mindset that turns our setback into stepping stones and our challenges into opportunities. Let me say that again. Let us cultivate a mindset that turns our setback into stepping stones and our challenges into opportunities. Have a mind to work. Let us forget some of the isms and the schism of 2023. Let us begin to work together under God towards the promises he has for us as a body. Have a mind to work. The people were able to rebuild the walls in 52 days because they had a mind to work. Remember, it's not merely about having a mind, but it's really about having a mind that is resolute, a mind that is focused, a mind that is ready to work in this season. It's, a, it's about having... It's about turning our aspirations into actions. Some things we need to start. Do God, we need to start get myself together because I am seen. I need to start go go Bible school because I'm seeing myself working in the ministry. God, I need to start go to learn a little bit in the music school. God, I need to to start practicing in the choir because I'm seeing the big choir. I need to. God, I need to start working more at the the altar. God, I need to do these things. Because you're turning the aspirations into actions. Your dreams that you're foreseeing of fam. The dream that you're seeing of this body into reality. And the challenges that we, are, that we have been facing over the years into triumphs. The people were able to rebuild the wall in 52 weeks. 52 days. Despite the challenges. Despite the opposition, despite the external challenges, despite the internal challenges, because the people had a mind to work. God bless you tonight. I pray God that under God, we will realize that the task ahead is great. But we serve a God who is able to bring it to pass. We serve a God who never fails at his word. And our God is able to bring all of these things. He is 
he is he is true to his word the word of god is true there is no lie and i pray god that as a body faith apostolic ministry even in your personal situations have a mind to work if god give you a word find a place of prayer understand the situation assess the situation know that it's going to be opposition but make up your mind because if you're persistent, God will bring it to pass. God bless you. Bow your heads as we close. Great God, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you, God, for the word that was spoken tonight. Build us together as a body. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a present help even in the time of trouble. Thank you, Lord, for being true to your word. Continue to bless faith apostolic ministry. Continue to bless our bishop, Pastor Bishop Garfield Daly. Continue, Lord Jesus, to give him vision. You say, without a vision, your people perish. Continue to give him insight. Touch every leader. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hold his hands. Amen. Help us, Lord Jesus, to lift up his hands. Touch every elder. Touch every minister. Praise God in the name of Jesus. Touch every head of department. Tell him, Lord Jesus, to, to realize that as we delegate the work together, tell him, Lord Jesus, to be on their knees in prayer about the plans that you have for us. Amen. The plans that you are going to bring to pass. I pray, God, that you'll help the doubters, the weak believers, that they too might come to strong faith in you. God, give us that mind. Give us that heart to work as we look to you, who is the author and the finish of our faith. In Jesus' name I pray tonight. Amen and amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. We look forward to us praying. We look forward to us praying and finding the mind of God for what God is about to do. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Remember, there's prayer for our services coming up. There's choir practice tomorrow. There's youth service on Friday. There's service on Sunday. Amen. Let us keep praying. And let us have a mind to do great things for 2024. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.